Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Man, wasn't that good? Thank you. Give this team a hand, would you? Amen. Appreciate Brian and the team. They were up here Thursday practicing, and uh, it's fun to watch people grow. I'm telling you, I, I love it. Um, we're starting a new series this morning. I want to start with a question. Uh, how many of you guys know what that is? Food truck. Yeah, how many of you guys ate from a food truck this week? Anybody? Okay, couple over here. You know, when I was growing up, uh, I would see food trucks, but I would always see food trucks on the uh, wrong side of town. Just going to be transparent with you for a minute. We always saw them on the wrong side of town. We never saw them on our side of the town, the upper middle class. And so we had a name for trucks like this. Does anybody know what that name was? Roach Coach, you bunch of sinners. <laughs> that's right. I know that's wrong, isn't it? It's a Roach Coach. And, and here's, what's, here's what's crazy. I, over the last 10 years, food trucks have become all the craze. I mean, they've even got a TV show about food trucks. And now some of the best food you'll ever eat comes out of trucks. I mean, it's kind of crazy, you know? I mean, who would, th who would have ever thought? But we, we were, uh, a couple of months ago, we were up in Tulsa, and Tulsa, Oklahoma has built this incredible park. If you've never been to it, you need to go. It's called the Gathering Place. It's, 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 it, is, it is one of the coolest places I've ever been. I'm, I'm telling you, as far as parks go. And, and so we were there, and we were playing and with the kids, and it's got all these different areas, and it was getting about lunchtime, and we were hungry. And, and you're never going to believe what they built in one of this incredible park. They built what's called a food truck alley it was crazy they had funnel cakes they had corn dogs they had burgers and might I say it was one of the best burgers I've ever had lemonade all these things going they even had Chinese food now that's wrong out of a truck amen <laughs> you should not be I mean you, you're brave to eat Chinese food on a buffet let alone out of a truck all right I talked to more people that get sick I'm doing that than anything else but um it was really incredible. And, and so if you have your Bibles, your apps this morning, I want you to turn to, over to Genesis chapter 1 because I want us to kind of enter into a season about imagine a church. Imagine church maybe looks a little bit different than how we grew up, maybe how we do church even today and how we view the mission that Jake was talking about a while ago. And, and we're going to go back to the very beginning because here's what we know, and, and this is no, no surprise. If you've been around Summit, you've heard me say this, you've heard Jake say this, you've heard our elders say this. If You've been through membership. It's like we say this all the time, but we know this to be true, don't we? We were created for relationship. We were. We all know that. And we know that we're relational beings. In fact, that, that's what we were created. That, in fact, that's what drives us. That's what moves us to, guys, you remember that, that you were a relational being one time because you sought her? You pursued her? And she even became your wife because there was something in you that, that you were relational. It's what may, drives us in our jobs. It's what drives us to make money. It's what drives us to get married, to go party. It even drives us to serve Facebook and be voyeurs. Amen? We were created for it. In fact, we even crave it. And sometimes when we say that as men, I'm talking about masculine men, males, we push back on that and go, no, I'm a caveman. No, listen, that's why you got married. Because there was something in you that craved relationship. Because we were created for that. In Genesis 1 and 2, we read the creation account about how God planned for us to do life. 
In fact, if you haven't read the creation account, I would challenge you to go home today and, and work your way through it because it's an incredible reminder of God's endless capabilities of all that he created and all the things he did. And, and with very little effort that he spoke the word and all of this came into being. It's an incredible story. What he was able to get done in six days for an A-top personality like me, just I love that, amen? He was knocking it out, man. And some of you that are not A-top personalities are going, we're going to do it tomorrow. I know. <laughs> he was cranking it, man. There's no one like him. He's God. But there's this reoccurring phrase that takes place in the creation account when God was just cranking it out over and over and over again. In fact, six times after God created, God said this. He said, he saw all that he had done, and it was good. And so he would create something, light, livestock, and his assessment of his own effort was, it is good. He's pleased. It's what he intended it to be. And on the sixth day, God created mankind. He created man, and he's so pleased with his last creation that over the last six days, he said, it is good. But then when it came to mankind, he added a word to that. He said, it's very good. He created us. And he said, it's very good. His prized creation tipped the scales of everything else he had created. Isn't that amazing? The moon and the stars and the water and the oceans and all the animals. And he created us. And he said, oh, that was good. But this, this is very good. This is good. And then the unexpected happens. I've read this passage, I don't know how many times, in this last week I was studying and, and I came across this, this statement and, and I don't know that I've ever really had it impact me the way it impacted me this last week. Because right in the middle of this, something unexpected happens after God created all of this and he, he's walking with mankind. He looks down and he says, it's not good. And it's interesting. In fact, look at Genesis 2.18. Up to this point, everything was just as it intended. And God says something's not right. In Genesis 2, verse 18, he said, it's not good. Everybody say not good. Not good. For a man to be what? Alone. To be what? Alone. For years. We've heard this passage quoted in marriage, and it, and it fits. And, and there's a reason why we quote that. But I think the implications go way further in affirming that you and I were created for relationship. See, at its core, this statement it's about our connecting well with others. And God was looking at this, and what's striking is that the fall had not yet occurred. Sin had not yet entered the world. And God looks down, and there was nothing marring his relationship between him and his created man. That, that they, were, they were walking in the cool of the evening in the garden, having conversations and enjoying the glory of God. Everything was good. Every word filled with joy. He's known, he's loved. And yet God uses to describe him, the man, as alone. And he said, aloneness is not good. Aloneness is not good. And you see, sometimes in church circles, we'll tell people, listen, you can't expect too much out of relationships with each other because there's a God-shaped void in your life that only God can fill. And while that's true, I think what we see here, apparently, according to the writer of Genesis and the God's creation process, God also created a man-shaped hole in our heart that money won't fill, popularity won't fill, achievement, busyness, books, not even God himself, that God created us not to be alone. He saw that it was not good, and he gave us community. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. Great, Ed. I already knew that. I know what it's like to be lonely. Can I just be honest with you? The reason I'm passionate about this this year, probably more, I, I've had more conversations over the last week, and it goes back even year, about people who are surrounded by people, and they're alone. They're lonely. And there's something in me that when our human-shaped void is not filled, it's not good. And see, I, I think some of you are there this morning. 
even though you're surrounded by 400 people in this room, you're here, even you may be watching on Facebook this morning and alone in your home, you know what I'm talking about. There's not good. And I know what some of you are thinking, but Edward, I'm not an isolationist. I actually like most people, right? I mean, you have Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter. You're surrounded by people at work. You drive to work around people. You come home to work from work around people. You're not an isolationist, right? But yet George Gallup did a poll several years ago, and here's what he said, and I believe it's even greater today. He said that Americans are among the loneliest people in the world. And that was over 10 years ago that he did that study. And now with the advent of social media and everybody hiding behind screens, it's no wonder they hadn't found Bigfoot I saw the other day because everybody's staring at their screens, amen? And so now with that, we're even more lonely than we've ever been in the history of America. In the midst of busy lives and overcommitted schedules and congested cities, we feel alone. And even though we drive on congested freeways, I know some of you moved out here to be alone, right? And you commute back into Dallas or you commute somewhere else every week and, and you're surrounded by people, but yet, yet something started happening in the 80s. You know what happened here? Let me describe. Here's what happened in the 80s and now it's even bigger today because when you come home from work and you may be retired when you get off the golf course, whatever it looks like for you, and you come home, some of you live in a gated community down the road, others live outside of it. You go into your community, you go behind the gate, you pull into your house, you raise the garage. I'll never forget this when I lived in Austin. It's the first time I ever had a garage with a garage door opener, amen? And so I remember I had this neighbor, and in Austin, our houses were about that far apart. You ever lived in a neighborhood like that? I mean, it's just like it's like a Martin house. But anyway, um, we, we pulled in, and my neighbor would pull in, and I would be out in the front yard. I'm an East Texas boy, right? So you know what we do in East Texas? We wave, don't we? What's up? Yeah. My neighbor pulls in. I'm, st- I, I'm, from Patty, I'm from here, away from his car. He raises his garage, pulls in. I'm, I'm literally, you know, and probably that's why he didn't roll his window down and stop because the, the creepy neighbor moved in, right? And, and they pulled in, and before they got out of their car, the garage was closing. And guess what? Many of us live that same way, don't we? We pull in, we make sure nobody's around, make sure nobody's looking. You get out of your car, you go in the house, you sit on your, t- your, your couch and you watch TV. And if you choose to go outside, guess what? You never go to the front porch. Danielle and I have been sitting on our front porch for the last couple of weeks. And I was sitting out there a couple of mornings ago and I was drinking coffee and, and I was just kind of surveying. It was a busy morning in our neighborhood. It's about 6.30 in the morning. And, and it's like, man, what are all these people doing? And, and everybody's running them down the road and we live in a neighborhood. So I'm just watching. And I, Danielle came out and joined me. I said, you know what, babe? It's interesting. Nobody ever sits on the front porch anymore. The front porch used to be a gathering place. It used to be a place where you would have conversation and community. And if some of you do go outside, I know, you go to the back porch, right? Because you've had enough. You don't want to have another conversation. And the last thing you want is for your neighbor to come over, right? You want to get away from them. You see, what happens for us, when we begin to avoid community, and we begin to avoid people, And we're just voyeurs on Facebook, judging our neighbors by what they share or what they like, or judging our friends, because we do. I can't believe they like that. There's a cost. There's a cost, because you and I were created for relationship. We are a culture craving relationship, and in the midst of this crowded existence, many of us are living lonely lives. Can I just stop here and say this to you? Don't miss next week. Don't miss next week. I'm telling you, don't miss next week. Bring somebody with you next week. You see, we live and work in a sea of humanity, but we end up missing out on the benefits of regular meaningful relationships. And when we're not in those meaningful relationships, we suffer consequences. We suffer consequences. And let me give you four of them. I'm going to put them up on the screen, and we're going to talk about them. There's four relational consequences or ailments that we suffer when we're not in community. Number one, when we live in isolation, we easily lose perspective on life. When we're not in a a, a relationship and don't have that objective voice in our journey to bring balance, amen? Our lows tend to be lower. Our highs tend to be higher. 
Our point of view becomes clouded and things seem to get worse or better than they really are. And then we turn inward and we're no longer self-aware because our only voice that we're listening to is our own. And by the way, if you just listen to your own voice, it'll lie to you. Amen? It lies to me. It says I'm much better or much worse than I really am. Depends on what day. Someday, man, I'll run through a brick wall. Other days, I can't even get out of bed. Amen? You know what I'm talking about. You see, when you live in isolation, you're going to lose perspective. And we'll lose perspective that this is a battle that we're in. Don't forget that, believer. You're in a battle. It's not a flesh and blood. The one sitting beside you is not your enemy. We're in a battle right now where the enemy's trying to destroy us. And when you're out of community, you are isolated. And by the way, sheep seldom get attacked in herds. Sheep get attacked when they're isolated, out and away. But see, here's the second thing for many of us. When you're not in community, you'll fear intimacy. People who don't have meaningful relationships tend to fear intimacy more. In fact, if you've never had close relationships, and you're going to tend to be more feel for, fearful of those kind of relationships. In fact, some of you grew up in what, 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 what's called a Sunday school model. And you grew up going to Sunday school, and, and, and Sunday school was about the transformation or, or just, the, uh, the, the, um, just, just information alone. If you go in and you get the information, you walk in, there wasn't a lot of community in that. And so this whole idea that you come to a place like this, or, or maybe you've been to another church and has small groups, and you, you all of a sudden hear that, wait a minute, you want me to go into their home? And I'm out. Because see, here's our fear. Our fear of intimacy is that if someone really knew you, they wouldn't like you. And what happens is, you just risk staying disconnected instead of really being known. You know, I think if you want the best preparation for you single folks in the room, if, if you really want to prepare for marriage, get involved in a small group. Because if you can get along with 12 people, you're going to do great when you get married to one. Amen? Because you learn to work out that intimacy. You learn to work that out. There's a track record of transparency. We And some of you, you're like, man, I don't, I don't know. And listen, I get that. Especially for men. Because we've been taught for so long, suck it up. Don't cry. Oh, if it ain't bleeding, you're all right. Is it fall off? Did you, did, did you cut it completely off? Suck it up, boy. And so we've learned to shut down as men, that little boy that desires relationship. See, here's the third thing. Disconnected people tend to be selfish. Isolation breeds selfishness, doesn't it? If the sum total of your life is defined by your schedule, your agenda, your needs, your desires, chances are you're suffering from a good dose of selfishness. Amen? I know, that, that's not fun to hear, is it? Because we've been taught we're rugged individualists, right? That's, that's the American dream, that we are rugged individualists, and we matter, and it's my dream, and I can have anything I want. The reality is it becomes very selfish when there's not another voice coming along beside you to give you that true north, true north or that balance. And over time, we become self-absorbed and we give in to that disconnection or that, that, that self-centeredness. And then life becomes very narrow. And, and, and here's the fourth thing that when we're not in community, and this is just interesting and we've seen studies about this, but John Ortberg in his book, Everybody's Normal Till You Get to Know Them, <laughs> says this, listen to this. He says, researchers found that the most isolated people we're three times more likely to die than those with strong relational connections. Now, this is interesting. People who had bad health habits, such as smoking, poor eating habits, obesity, and alcohol abuse, but strong social ties, lived significantly longer than people who had great health habits but were isolated. So in other words, it's better to eat Twinkies with good friends than to eat broccoli alone, amen? <laughs> Yeah, I read that this last week, and there's a, there, there was a bar that closed in Longview, and it's been open for years, and it's, it's called the It'll Do Tavern or whatever, and every picture they showed of these people, they were older than dirt, <laughs> and they were talking about how long they'd been following this one bar owner, and, and these guys drank like a fish, and every one of them looked like they'd smoked like a smoky pear, amen, I mean, it was just crazy. I thought about this this week. Because even in bad health, not making good decisions when you're in community, something changes. Something changes. Clinical psychologist Henry Cloud 
says this, a person's ability to love and connect with others lays the foundation for both psychological and physical health. The research illustrates that when we're in a loving relationship, a bonded relationship, we're growing. And when we're isolated, he says, we're slowly dying. You see, life, living life without meaningful connection is not good because it's not what God intended. God created us for relationship. In fact, living life alone doesn't even accurately reflect the one of whose image we bear. When people see my son Springer and they see us walking together, they always tell me, you can't deny him. He's built just like you. He's got my butt, my gut. He's got my shoulders. He's my height. He's going to look just like me. God bless that boy. <laughs> Amen? Because, thanks. Thank you, baby. <laughs> That's awkward. Anyway, um, <laughs> guess what? You reflect your father's image. You reflect your father's image just as well. But he's your heavenly father. And God is a relational being. In fact, as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, he's three in one. In fact, look at Genesis 1, verse 26. God said, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our what? Image. So God created man in his own image. Just as he exists in meaningful relationship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, so we are to exist in equality relationships as well. He's created us for that. It's part of our genetic makeup. That's what drives some of you. That's why some of you go into deep depression when you're disconnected. Because we're created to be in his image. That God is a relational being and he created his prized possessions. The one where he looked down and said, oh, this is very good. He created us to be in relationship, it's not good because it's not how he created us to live. And alone and isolated, we never, we never should be used to describe his most prized connection. It's not good because we're created for deep, rich, meaningful relationships. And without it, we don't reflect the image of the one who created us. In fact, Dr. Cloud goes on to say God created us with a hunger for relationship, for relationship with him and with our fellow people. And at the very core we're relational beings. In fact, the soul cannot prosper without being connected to others. So what do we do? Well, what if we reimagine church altogether? What if church is more than just coming and sitting in rows? What if church is more than just coming in here and listening to me or Jake or Joe or somebody else? What if it could be, remember those food trucks? Watch this. When we think of church, we usually think of a place where people with spiritual hunger can go to get fed. Sort of a religious restaurant in the community. If you think about it, many churches actually operate like a restaurant. Restaurants exist in convenient locations, surrounded by clear signage to attract consumers. They offer a menu of items to choose from, and even a special menu for kids. The professional staff meet your every need and make sure you are fully satisfied. Some restaurants become so successful, they have to increase their seating capacity or franchise into other locations. Their high-profile chefs turn into celebrities and gain a cult following. Sound familiar? Recently, restaurant-style churches have had their problems. As a result, churches in many places are going out of business. But what if we could reconsider church, not just as a place, but as a people, and not just existing on Sundays, but seven days a week? Imagine if church was more than a service we attend to get fed by professionals and programs, but rather all the followers of Jesus engaging in God's mission. What if the local church operated more like a fleet of food trucks? Food trucks are small, mobile, and go to people rather than waiting for people to come to them. Each one features a specialized menu designed to connect with different palettes. And because they are easier to open and led by small teams, more people can get in on the action. Food truck style churches prefer to operate out in the world. 
in non-religious spaces. They creatively communicate the good news of Jesus to those who pursue meaning outside of traditional church gatherings. The specific context they dwell in determines what forms of worship and rhythms of discipleship they practice. When food truck operators gather together, it's not simply to get fed, but to reflect, refuel, and recruit for the work ahead. Food truck churches go by many names and take many forms to express the kingdom of God, but they all share a conviction that everyone can contribute, including you. You can start a new group, pioneer a new project, or join an existing one in your city. Together, we can all reclaim the church's identity as a community sent to join the mission of God and embody the life of Jesus in the places where people live, work, and play. Now then, who's ready to get on board? Isn't that cool? What if you could be an operator? What, what if you began to operate your own small group out in the world, going to where they are? It's even in line with the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples. And now more than ever, I think the church can provide an authentic biblical community. You see, there's more than just coming in here, and I think we should come in here to, to reflect and to refuel and to recruit, amen? And we do that every week. But for you and me and our families and our neighbors and our coworkers, that we can actually go and connect with them in community. That's how God intended us to live. It's hardwired in our souls. Larry Crabb says it this way, as our lungs require air, so our souls require what only community provides. We were designed to live in relationship. Without it, we die. It's that simple. So as we close this morning, let's go back to Genesis and that creation account. I don't know if you've read that in a while, but did you ever notice that the first thing God spoke to Adam and Eve was a blessing? The very first thing he ever spoke, when he created Adam and Eve and he placed them in the garden, God blessed them with the following words. Look at Genesis 1, verse 28. Here's what he said. He said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And we all know the story, but we miss the impact of these words. Because there's a lot of things God could have done to make a first impression, right? Can you imagine the display of power that God could have come in. He could have rolled up on a tricked out chariot, right? With speakers and all that. And, and they're like, whoa, look at that, right? Or how about this? What if God, the very first thing he did is did a, did a cosmic firework show from, from the heavens? Wouldn't that be cool? That's probably what I'd have done. He could have, he's God. You know, he could have scared them with threats. Let me tell you something. You're in the garden. Don't you do it. Because that's how we respond, don't we? When we get a new building or we get a new home, we don't bless it. We set down the house rules, right? And God could have done that. But God's first words to Adam and Eve showcased his goodness. Showcased the goodness of God. See, I think some of you need to hear that this morning. Because some of you grew up in a church that only showcased an angry God. And some of you need to hear this morning that God, his intention, his original intention, and I'm going to show you in a minute, it hadn't changed. That God had a vision. Jake was talking about this a while ago. The, ma the amazing thing about that verse that we just read is that the blessing was woven together with purpose. That God had a purpose. He had a vision for the earth. He had a vision for what he wanted it to be full of people, bursting with life. And he commissioned Adam and Eve, go and multiply. Amen? Their work brought them purpose, a valuable place in the world. It gave them an opportunity to, to be creative, to enjoy each other, to enjoy creation. That was God's intention. He wanted them to experience a fulfillment of a day's work, the satisfaction of seeing what they've created and seeing what they've managed. God saw it fit to let his creation become creators. He invited us to be a part of that. And the desire to be happy and fulfilled was not Adam and Eve's idea. It was God's idea that we would be fulfilled, that we would be happy, that we would be blessed. And God said, look, here's what I want you to do, and I'm going to bless you to go do this. He had a purpose for them. And I say he has a purpose for us today to create, to be fulfilled, and to have purpose in loving God 
in loving people. In fact, it matches Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Look at this. This is interesting. And by the way, this is the Edward Crouch version in case you wonder what version this is. He says, all authority has been given to me. In other words, I got the power. Amen. That's what Jesus said. He says, I got the power. All authority has been given to me. And he's sending out his disciples in the new covenant when he did this. He said, listen, because all authority has been given to me. I got the power. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples. Teach them to obey all things that I've taught you. And I'm going to be with you as you go. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid as you go out and create these new communities, as you create this new discipleship, as you go and share all the things that I've taught you and you're teaching someone else to go do that. Don't be afraid because I am with you. And can I just say this to some of you? As we think of our small groups in our community as food trucks that run all over the place, some of you are scared to death. And some of you are sitting there going, Edward, Edward, you don't understand. I'm too busy. I, I, don't, I can't do this. Come back next week, okay? Don't miss next week. I'm just telling you, relationships cost. Let me say that again. Relationships cost. They're going to cost you if you don't have them. And if you want to be in them, they're going to cost you. They're worth it. It falls in line with God, God created us. It falls in line you see, here's what happens when you begin to study God's word together. When you go out in these food truck models and you're loving on this community, you're loving on your community at work, you're loving on your community in retirement, you're loving on your community by inviting people over and doing study together. Here's what happens. Community, when you're in biblical, authentic community, all of a sudden sin looks bad, amen? In fact, you ought to be in a group that makes sin look bad. Some of you are not in those groups. You're in groups that make sin look fun. And that's not what you were designed for. May you be in a group that makes sin look bad, God look big, grace look tangible, and the gospel look true. Let's say that again. That makes sin look bad. That makes God look big. Grace look tangible. And the gospel look true. You see, I want people in my community where I live, in Hawkins, America, I want them to see, my God, how big he is. I want them to see that grace is tangible, that he loves them. And I want them to see that the gospel is true, that it's good news. May we be involved in groups. I see, here, as your pastor, here's what I want. And this is what I believe. And this is what's gotten me in trouble through the years, amen? So I'm going to go ahead and make a confession. Because as your pastor, once you're in a small group, I stop worrying about you. I do. Once you're in a small group, in fact, I've had people tell me, man, you hadn't called me in nine months. I don't need to. You're in a small group. Amen? Because now I know your needs are being addressed. Yeah, but I want you, pastor. I got my own small group. Didn't like that, did you? Because you came from a church where the pastor was everything. I'm not. I'm one. See, when you get in a small group, I quit worrying about you. Because then I know your needs are going to be addressed. Well, you didn't come see me in the hospital. But your whole dang small group did. <laughs> well, what did you? I know. Well, I got a family and I got my own small group. Amen? So get in your group. So I don't have to worry about you anymore. Amen? I, I know that sounds nuts, doesn't it? But isn't that healthy? That's what we were created for. And so we're going to invite you over these next few weeks. Jake's going to be teaching. I'm going to be teaching to get in a group. And if you have a group, we're going to encourage you to stay in that group and keep going. And we're even going to invite some of you out of your group and offer you a food truck. Not really. <laughs> so I heard one guy go, oh, well, baby, come get a food truck. Um, no. It's a concept. We're going to invite you to be an operator, to go to your community, invite others in, to make God look big, make sin look bad, make grace look tangible, and let the gospel be true. And then we'd gather back here on Sunday, and we would reflect, we'd refuel, and we'd recruit. Would you be in my group? Would you be in my group? Would you be in my group? Hey, I want you. Hey, I want you. Let me close with this, because I, I used to get in trouble for this as a youth pastor. 
when I was on staff back in the late 90s, there was this church we had a lot of us on staff. There was 1,200 people that went to our church. And, and I remember when I sat in staff meeting, the people used to always tell me, you have the best volunteers. You have the best volunteers. You, in fact, you have more volunteers than anybody else in our ministry. Why do you, why, you need to share the volunteers. And I'd look at them and go, no, I'm not sharing. Well, that's not fair that you have all the good ones. And so here's my question I'd ask them. When's the last time you walked through the auditorium and just asked somebody, would you be on my team? Would you come to work on my food truck? Got real quiet in the room. Because every Sunday as a youth pastor, I would walk the aisles and I'd look at them. Hey, can you fog a mirror? Would you be on, on my staff? I'd love for you to join. You ever thought about working in youth ministry? Oh, I don't work with you. Can you hold a door? Well, I can do that. Hey, come join my staff. Would you fill out this? You, and I, it's every week I would do that. By the way, what if we did that in our small groups? And I got turned down a lot because some people go, man, I'm already in preschool. I'm already in children, I'm doing children's choir, or singing the choir. Remember those days? And, and all those stuff. I just keep asking because I wanted everybody. And see, I'm still a believer. Jake said it yesterday. He harasses me for this for years. I, I'm just foolish enough to believe that every one of you in this room could be in a small group. In fact, I believe God designed you for that. And maybe you're just a worker on a truck. Maybe you're the operator who leads that group. And so we're going to invite you to be a part of that. We're going to invite some of you out to give you your own small group. And you're going to hear stories over these next few weeks about people who stepped out and taken that risk and just how easy it was. It was so easy. So I hope you'll come back. Amen. Let's pray together and we're going to take communion and we're going to worship. And we're just going to reflect this week about what that looks like. That you and I were created for community. So Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you that we get to be in this place. Thank you, Father, that you've invited us to be a part. That you created us in your image. And yet, God, I know there's folks here this morning that God, they're lonely, and they're hurting. And Father, I'm reminded of the conversations I've had this week. Some in this room have suffered great loss this week, the last two weeks. They've suffered, and they're, they need you. So God, I pray this morning, that as we just worship together for a few minutes, as we take communion, as our elders and prayer team gather across this front, I know there's some folks that they just may need to be prayed over today. And God, if there's somebody here this morning that doesn't know you and they've never entered into a relationship with you, would you give them courage? Would you convict them that they may be saved today? So Father, I love you. Thank you that we get to respond. Thank you that we get to be in community this morning. And God, as we worship, as we respond, may we honor you. Bless this time. We ask it in that beautiful name, Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Let's stand together, and uh, let me give you some instructions. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take communion if you've never been here. We have two tables in the front, two in the back. And, and by the way, guys, I, I want to say this about communion. This is not tacked on to the end of the service. This is worship. As often as you eat and drink, remember, this is my body and my blood that was sacrificed for you. This is an act of worship that we get to participate in as a community. And so I want you to worship together if you know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, then I would challenge you to look into your heart. Is he calling you today? He loves you. And that's why these elders and these prayer teams are up here. They would love to lead you to Christ this morning. If you don't know how or you've never entered into that, we would invite you to come and be saved today. And then after you've responded and maybe you've been prayed over and you've taken communion, Brian and the team are going to lead us in a worship and then we'll be dismissed to go out into the community and make a difference, to come back next week, to reflect, to refuel, and maybe even recruit. Amen? Let's respond. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to 
uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.